Well, hello, everyone. It's so nice to see you all here. As I said before, uh, I am Danny Nierenberg, and I am Food Tank's president. For those of you who don't know, Food Tank is a research and advocacy organization really devoted to highlighting stories of hope and success in food and agriculture systems around the globe. And that's really why I'm so glad to be with you all today. I, I wanna thank Oatly and the organizers for including Food Tank. I also wanna thank all of you who could be here in person uh, as well as those of you who are joining virtually. And I, I hear there are a lot of you. It's so great to see so many old and new friends, both in this room and, and folks who I know are watching online. During this event today, we will be discussing the role that food and beverage companies can have in really helping shift towards a more sustainable food system. As we know, the global food system is a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. But what I personally find so hopeful is that food can also be this really incredibly powerful solution. And food and beverage companies, because of their immense power, can help support governments and civil society to achieve major climate goals. Or they can do the opposite. And, and, and I just think that's no longer acceptable. We are at a point in time where the urgency is too great and food and beverage companies need to step up to the plate. What we need is more companies and organizations and governments that believe that their business strategies must include helping solve the climate crisis. I truly hope this is the COP where policymakers, dignitaries, civil society, and all of us can agree that we can't solve the climate emergency without transforming our food and agriculture systems and investing in new business models that support farmers, eaters, and businesses alike. I'm really, really glad to welcome our keynote speaker who will kick off today's discussion and hopefully be a little provocative. It's really my pleasure to introduce Pat Brown, the founder and CEO of Impossible Foods. Impossible Foods is really working to make nutritious, delicious meat and dairy products from plants to satisfy meat lovers and address the environmental impact of industrial animal farming. And, and Pat is somebody who's really a true visionary. I've heard him speak many times he realizes that transformation is not only possible, but it's really necessary. And Impossible Foods has been able to do something that no other vegan food company has done. Because it's it really tastes so delicious, it's made my friends and family stop questioning why I decided to go plant-based as a teenager. Now they finally get it. So I want to thank you for that, Pat. And I want to invite you to, to talk for about 15 minutes. We're so honored to have you. Please give a round of applause. Well, thanks for that nice introduction, Danny, and I am very happy to be here. Um, so um, it's very weird to me that um, I'm here sort of as a representative of the food industry, which, you know, 15 years ago was like probably number, you know, million on my list of, of likely trajectories. Um, I, until I got into this, I had very little, sorry to say, very little interest in food, not that I didn't like food, but I never thought about it. And I absolutely had no desire, no interest to, uh, to go into the business world. And yet here I am in the food business. So um, the, the way I wound up here um, is basically that a little over 10 years ago, um, I, I was a research scientist and professor at Stanford and I, uh, was trying to decide what, what was the most impactful thing I could do um, uh, next. And as I did my research, I realized that um, number one, and I'll explain some of why this is true, um, that I, I hadn't realized it, but the most destructive technology on earth and the most destructive technology I think in human history is the use of animals um, to make food, to turn plants into meat and fish and dairy foods. Um, it's worse than the fossil fuel industry and I'm happy to get into that debate. Um, and nobody was serious, no, not only was uh, um, uh, nobody seriously working on it, um, but no one was really much talking about it. And um, so basically I felt like, okay, well, I can't just sit there and leave this situation um, you know, I got to do something about it. And um, I was a biochemist and a molecular biologist and so forth. And I realized that actually um, it was doable, that 
that the foods that we need to replace, the technology we need to replace, um, basically is, is, is based on relatively simple, um, you could say biochemistry, that the, the, the things that people love about meat and fish and dairy foods are sort of an emergent property of, of their biochemistry. And that could be understood if we actually focus on understanding it. And then we could use that understanding to make foods that deliver all the things that consumers love about those foods, particularly the deliciousness, that's the hard part. Um, nutrition is easy. We're talking about foods that are, you know, have their issues. Um, and cost is easy because, um, you know, at scale, making foods from plants is vastly, vastly cheaper than transforming them with pitiful efficiency into, into animals um, to eat. So that's how I got into this. Um, anyway, so we're here in Glasgow, um, primarily to talk about uh, climate change. I think it's worth saying that um, there's another issue that's very intertwined with this, and obviously Landscape Forum is very well aware of this, uh, which is that we're also in, in the late stages of a global collapse of biodiversity that is, is still progressing, has wiped out uh, more than two thirds of the wild animals that were living on Earth 50 years ago and shows no sign of stopping. And it's almost entirely, that is almost entirely due to our use of animals as a food technology. Um, the land footprint of animal agriculture, which is about 40% of ours, when you talk about global landscapes, Basically, the human impact on global landscapes is animal agriculture, and that's almost full stop. All the cities on Earth fit on less than 1% of Earth's land area. The, 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 the crops that we grow to consume directly as food fit on about 5% of Earth's land area, and then animal ag is 40% of Earth's land area. So that's, um, that's another reason why you know, this is a good topic to talk about. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, I realized that the overwhelmingly most important action we could take is to find a way to um, uh, replace animals as a technology with better technology that not only is more sustainable, but creates a better product. And um, another uh, just observation before I get into the main point of what I want, want to talk about is that there's this, there's this thing that drives me nuts. Um, which is that people talk about like the food system is a climate problem. You know, the food system has a role in the biodiversity collapse. That's kind of like saying, you know, instead of uh, calling out, you know, the oil industry, it's like liquids are, you know, a climate problem. It's all about animal ag. Every other part of the food system is just a total rounding error in terms of environmental impact. We should forget about saying it's the food system. It's the animal ag system, it's livestock. That's the problem. <clears throat> the rest is virtually irrelevant um, as a climate and biodiversity problem. Um, okay, so that's, that's part of that spiel. Now let me just move on to uh, a, a topic that is um, should be a cause for great hope about climate change. Well, maybe not. Okay. Um, and that is that, um, you know, the climate, the climate, uh, the greenhouse gases that are emitted by the fossil fuel industry or by the, the use of fossil fuels uh, as an energy system is essentially ir irreversible. I mean, you're not gonna be able to turn the carbon dioxide that came from burning oil and fossil and, and coal um, back into oil and coal. If you did it, the energy it would take to do that would create its own climate problems. It's just not gonna happen. Um, but animal agriculture is completely different. It's almost completely reversible as a cause of climate change. And this is, this is what, um, this, this slide is about. So why is it reversible? Because basically the, the, the biggest cause of CO2 emissions from animal, virtually the only cause of CO2 emissions from animal ag historically is that 40% of Earth's land area was cleared of its pre-existing biomass to make room for mostly cows and sheep and grazing animals as well as feed crops, okay? And in that process, 
the um, the amount of biomass that was uh, um, con converted into CO2 to clear the land, this, the, the carbon content was equivalent to 22 years worth of fossil fuel emissions at the current rate. That's, that's the, the, the problem that it caused and the opportunity because you can turn CO2 back into coal, but you can turn it back into biomass, okay? You can literally reverse the process. And what it requires is clearing the livestock and feed crops off the land and allowing the native ecosystems to recover or allowing or actually facilitating the process of, of recovery, which is the biggest step you can take not only to um, address climate change, but also um, the, the biodiversity collapse, okay? It's reversible. And, um, but that's not the only part of it that's reversible. Uh, there's also methane and nitrous oxide, which are powerful greenhouse gases. Um, animal agriculture is overwhelmingly the responsible for nitrous oxide. It's about 90% plus of nitrous oxide emissions come from animal agriculture. And about half of methane emissions um, uh, come from animal agriculture. And the thing about nitrous oxide and methane is that they're um, unstable. They spontaneously decay, which means if you turn off emissions, you're not stuck with them in, 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 in the atmosphere. They spontaneously decay. So what this slide illustrates is, this is from a paper that uh, I wrote with a colleague of mine at Berkeley, Mike Eisen, that's, that's coming out any minute now. And uh, what it shows is, so the, the, the axis, the y-axis is basically um, the amount of energy that's being captured continuously by greenhouse gases. Um, and it's basically the, the um, uh, right now on the left, it's a little over 2.5 watts of heating per square centimeter. So just think of a 2.5 watt heating element over each square element of earth. That's the amount of heat that we're getting from, from climate change. And this is the trajectory we're on that, that solid line up there. And you can see it's almost gonna double um, over the next hundred, uh, over the next 80 years um, if we don't do something about it, okay. The dashed line is the trajectory we'd be on if we eliminate uh, animal agriculture over the next 15 years. That is exactly um, Impossible Foods mission. We set out to um, completely replace animals of food technology globally by 2035. And I think we're on course to do that. Um, the green sector here, that's, that's the amount of, of greenhouse gases that can be uh, removed by just simply biomass recovery on animal agland. The, per, the purple sector is what we get from methane decay. It's, it's, it's the, the decay of the methane that's being uh, uh, continuously emitted currently by livestock. And the red sector is decay of nitrous oxide, okay? The net effect of those is um, that by the end of the century, if we keep doing the idiotic things we're doing in the rest of the economy, um, this would still offset 68% of the greenhouse gas emissions from the entire rest of the economy, all the fossil fuel emissions and so forth, okay? Um, another important thing about this action that's very different from fossil fuels is that we get the benefits fast. And it's really important to get the benefits fast because every hour that, that those heat lamps are on, it's continuing to heat the planet and we have to turn them down fast or by the time we turn them down, you know, we're gonna be way up there. So this is a very fast acting solution as, a, as, as opposed to high impact. And it will give us a 30 year pause in the uh, uh, rise of greenhouse gases if we can just turn off animal agriculture in the next 15 years, okay? 30 year pause um, during which hopefully people will get smart enough to address the other, other cause of fossil fuel emissions. Um, I, I had, could you put the next slide on? Just I just have a very quick thing to say about that. This is basically looking at what happens if, if we phase out animal agriculture over the next 15 years, and we also get to net zero fossil fuel emissions by 2050, okay, which is the nominal goal, although good luck um, actually getting there because it, it's all, as everybody's complaining in the protests that we're there, it's all babble. 
uh, um, inside COP and not action. But anyway, if we did do that, the interesting thing is, first of all, by 2050, okay, the overwhelming majority of the climate benefits would have come from eliminating animal agriculture um, rather than phasing out fossil fuels. And um, by the end, end of the century, almost half of the benefit would have come from eliminating animal agriculture. But, but the point is, you can see how much faster we get those benefits um, by phasing out animal agriculture. Okay, that's, that's the scientific lecture for the day, but, um, but um, now the way, okay, two minutes. Okay, I can do this in two minutes. Um, the way we're approaching the problem is basically when I found the company, I said, look, we're not gonna solve this by waiting for government or COP or the UN or anyone to solve it. I mean, we see how well that works, right? Um, this is something that requires individual action. And to be frank, it requires radical action because the, 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 the babble that's going on there is basically because nobody wants things to change much. They want to do things that don't ruffle any feathers. They don't, you know, everybody comes out, no one gets, you know, disrupted or anything like that. And yet somehow with no disruption, this radical thing will somehow mag magically happen. That's not gonna be true. The, what, we're, what we're trying to do on Impossible Foods is the least radical thing we could do. It's entirely market-based, and I think it creates a great outcome for, for uh, farmers. And um, so what, you know, we developed a technology and we're still developing technology that enables us to create uh, delicious meat um, entirely from plant ingredients. And that's the most important thing. It's vastly more nutritious, more sustainable, but it doesn't matter. No one cares if it's not delicious. And the proof of concept, I'm not advertising impossible foods here, but just to show this is possible. We now have four products that uh, um, I think two of them are on the market where we've done very large consumer tests, blind tests, don't know which they're eating with meat eaters. Uh, and our products have a majority of the consumers have said they're more delicious than the animal products. In fact, we just released a product that is a chicken nugget. Um, that's probably not a thing in, in, in the UK. It's kind of like the fish and chips of America maybe. And, um, uh, and our, our, our nuggets decisively beat the animal products. And actually there was just a show that, that reviewed all the chicken nuggets on the market, America's Test Kitchen, that uh, said the impossible nuggets tasted more like chicken than the chicken nuggets. And it's, it's an important thing about, about you know, this kind of technology to replace animals in the food system, which is you, you can actually make meat that's more delicious than what the animals can make because a chicken is not trying to be delicious. It's not working on the problem. And if people think it doesn't taste enough like chicken, well, you're stuck with it. If people think our nuggets don't taste enough like chicken, okay, we'll make them taste more like chicken. And that's the decisive advantage. So what I want to say is, first of all, this is, we're determined to solve the problem. I have 100% confidence we're gonna solve the problem. It doesn't have to be all on impossible foods, but it's not gonna be solved by people blabbing about it. It has to be individual action. And the only way, and that it's absolutely critical, argue with me, we have to get rid of animal agriculture, full stop as fast as possible. And we can talk about fishing, as well, another day. <laughs> but that. Thanks, Pat. I, I told you he'd be provocative. So I think we have a lot to talk about. And I want to get into some of these, these points you brought up in a, in a little bit. But I'd like to invite our other panelists to come to the stage, please. Okay. <laughs> So we have a really great group of people and it's really my pleasure to have them all here. Um, I wanna make sure, yes, Louise is online, yay, right. Louise. So, um, I, you know, there, there's a lot that we can do in this discussion, but what I'd like to have is a really lively interactive conversation around the critical role of food and beverage companies and, and their global efforts to combat climate change. I think now more than ever, it's that urgency I talked about before. We can't sit back and, and you know, have all talk and no action, as Pat said. So, uh, Louise, I'd like to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself, if you could. 
Absolutely. Thanks so much, Danny. Hi, everyone. I'm Louise. I'm joining in from the Philippines. I'm a chef, farmer, and entrepreneur, and I founded my social venture called The Cacao Project, which really aims to build new models of food systems that cultivate resilient livelihoods for farmers here in my hometown. Now, I'm also a UN Environment Program Young Champion of the Earth, a National Geographic Young Explorer, and a Forbes Under 30 Entrepreneur. And really, I want to talk about the link of land stewardship and climate action and climate justice, making it accessible all. Thank you so much, Louise. Every time I listen to you talk, I just get tired. You do so much. <laughs> so you're, you're a phenomenon. Thank you so much. Um, Ashley, could you introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ashley Allen. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer of Oatly. Um, Oatly's co-hosting this panel, so I know you've, you've heard our name mentioned already. We are an oat milk or oat uh, product company uh, based out of Sweden, but now global uh, all over the place and, and growing by the minute. So thanks. It's great to be here and it's great to um, have the audience online as well. Thank you. Jess, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, Jess Fiera. I'm the Senior Director of Sustainability at Appeal. At Appeal, we are focused on food waste. We've developed a plant-derived coating that's applied to fresh fruits and vegetables that slows down the rate of spoilage. So those fruits and veggies last up to twice as long. Um, and really, our focus is on extending the shelf life so that we can reduce food waste. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little more later. Wonderful. Thank you. Tanya? So I'm Tania Eulalia Martinez Cruz. I'm an independent researcher. I'm also a youth indigenous woman, and I'm here on behalf of the Global Hub on Indigenous People's Food Systems. We work in, in bringing up evidence to put indigenous knowledge and indigenous food systems up front at policy level for, with FAO. Well, we know who Pat is at this point, <laughs> but let's give these uh, panelists a round of applause. It's so great to have them here. I want us to move around a little bit and get warm. So I, I, we have a few guiding questions for today's discussion that I, I want you to keep in the back of your head as people are talking. So the first is, what is your organization or company doing to champion or drive meaningful action on climate? The second is, what critical research or innovation is needed to further a global shift and the transformation to a more sustainable food system? And the third is, from your perspective, what would be the most critical action? What could we do very drastically to make sure that we have a, a really um, consequential shift uh, by policymakers to a more sustainable food system that, that really addresses the climate crisis? Because we are just nibbling around the edges in so many ways. What is, going to, what is it going to take to really solve this problem in a meaningful way? So I, I wanna dive in right now with each of you. And again, I really want this to be a conversation. Interrupt each other, um, don't get any fights, take that outside. Um, and, and then really feel free to build on what one another says and, and you know, just make this a conversation. And, and Louise, I'll constantly be looking at you to make sure that you can get in as well. So you, my first question is, is actually to you, Louise. And, You've been working directly with farmers on a number of different things, as you described in your introduction, um, including agroforestry to help mitigate climate change and, and also really highlight the role of indigenous and traditional practices. So I'm wondering if you can just maybe for a few minutes talk a little bit more about that work and how it is part of our solutions to solving the climate crisis. Absolutely, definitely, yeah. So the Cacao Project really is um, working to rethink our food systems by equipping farmers with resources that they need to build climate adaptable livelihoods, um, especially working towards uh, with towards nature and towards regeneration. So we were curating trading programs for local farmers involving agroecology on mixing our own organic fertilizers and pesticides instead of using chemical inputs. And also on disaster preparedness and finance and merging old farming practices uh, with new knowledge to help cultivate better landscape stewardship. And our goal is really to improve and diversify the way we grow food with plants and crops and include entrepreneurial training to help farmers understand the broader spectrum of how our food systems functioned. And through the project, we realized that we could mitigate impacts of biodiversity loss as a result of agriculture and climate disasters and create agroforests that could sequester uh, CO2, about 4,400 4, 
100 per hectare per year and improve soil quality in areas with rapidly degrading or acidifying soil. And on top of that, we're also working to really disassemble the stigma associated with agriculture in our country, where we want to encourage more young people to build successful paths in these food systems um, and avoid the risk of food scarcity in the near future. But in the end, we're really working on a long term solution on a new model that rethinks existing food systems and, you know, from the planning all the way to the production stage throughout the whole supply chain. That's wonderful. And, and it, it sounds like, it, you know, in an essence, it's really resilience building. Uh, I want to uh, touch on a, a point that you mentioned and, and turn to Tanya. This idea of destigmatizing th these traditional practices, that is so important because so for so long, traditional practices have been looked down upon. Governments, the World Bank have all invested in, in sort of modernization and ignoring indigenous people's practices. And I'm wondering if you can build on, on what Louise was able to say. Yeah, thank you. I was actually going to, to tell Louise, we want you on board in your global <laughs> hub with all the practices you're doing. Um, so let me just give you an example, because I think I learned a lot when I go and work with farmers, with indigenous peoples. So one of them, one leader, one Awahun leader from the Amazonas in Peru was telling me recently that once he was talking to the Minister of Social Development, they eat some worms that they call suris. And he came really happy to the meeting with the minister and said, I got you a present and this is really precious and valuable for my people the minister started to scream and said, what do you want me with, to do with these insects? And basically his message was, when people design policies that do not fit for context, when they do not understand how do we live, what do we eat, that's the way we feel. So the message also is what we're trying to do from the Global Hub, a, it's to gather experiences, like Danielle said, there are many myths around traditional foods, indigenous foods, and I think um, just that a Patrick was talking about the loss of biodiversity, how we are affecting the world. A, the 80% of the remaining biodiversity in the world remains in indigenous territory. Some people ask me, and why is that relevant? Imagine that we account only for the 6% of the population and live in 25% of the land surface, and still we are capable of keeping that biodiversity. So when we think about what should we be learning and doing differently, it's learning from many of these practices. Like a lot of these uh, food practices, I love also giving the example of the tojonos in the desert. In the driest season of the year, they have saguaros and they harvest what they find in the season. And that's how they feed themselves. And there are many practices like that. There are some studies, for example, that ask why is that people in the Arctic, when they eat fish, were healthy many years ago? Um, just eating fish. And one of the secrets is not only about what you eat, but how do you combine what you eat over the years, over, over, this, over, the, over, over the year, let's say. So it's about season, seasonability or how, what do you harvest? What do you eat? What do you crop? When we talk about food production and food policy, usually we talk about, yes, what we sow, but we fail to understand that it's not only about putting a seed a raising livestock, but it's also about what we can find in the surroundings and many other practices. And that's why we are trying to bring those experiences together from the global hub, trying to learn from indigenous populations around the world and how they have adapted to a different context. Sorry, I, it was too long. No, that's great. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Let's give you a round of applause. I mean, I, there's so much rich tradition that we're ignoring, and it baffles me that while we're facing this huge climate crisis that we don't look to Indigenous peoples because of the resilience they have created. So thank you again for that. I, I do want to shift gears a little bit now and talk to both Jess and Ashley uh, about the work that you do, because there's no doubt, and, and Pat, you feel free to comment on this as well. There's no doubt that consumers are demanding healthier products, products with a story behind it, products that they can feel good about buying at their grocery store, their farmer's market, or their co-op, wherever. And, and you know, I, I think more and more consumers want information about a company's supply chain practices. They want more transparency. They want traceability. They want all these things that maybe they didn't know about 10 years ago. And so I, I'm wondering, you know, you're both, you both have to be, all, all three of you have to be recognizing these trends and responding to them on a daily basis, especially as, as younger consumers become more informed. So I'm just wondering, maybe you can talk a little bit about why it's important to respond to those trends. And maybe Ashley, you go first. 
Yeah, thanks. I, I Before I move on to consumers, just a, a, a quick mention on Farmer's Night. I, it's probably not often that I would disagree with Patrick. I think most oftentimes we probably will be in agreement, but I just want to, this is supposed to be a provocative discussion, right? right? So I just want to disagree with one point um, on Patrick, and that is, um, I actually think the food system is the problem. I actually think it's, it, you will never get an argument out of me that animal agriculture is driving a big, big majority of the problem. But if if we got rid of animal agriculture today and and continued to grow plant based products in the same way that they are grown today, and not paying attention to the lessons um, that Tanya is talking about and Luis is talking about, um, we would still have a broken food system. And so I think you know working with farmers. Um, understanding both their needs. Um, they're the ones that are suffering in this food system right. often, and it's not helping them. So, so transforming that food system in a way that not only transitions us away from animal agriculture, but also brings in farmers' knowledge and needs, and then builds back the system in the way that it can actually uh, produce the food we need more sustainably, not just lower emissions, but overall more sustainably and in a more circular way, I, I think still is critically important, even though of course the biggest impact that we will get from that is the transition um, from animal agriculture. Absolutely. So I just wanted to bring that up, well, hopefully that was okay. Before you talk about Oatly, yeah. I, I also wanna, you know, I think at every conversation we have, whether it's this kind of global summit or a smaller conversation, farmers always need to be at the table. Absolutely. And I, I'm glad Louise is here. I'm glad Tanya is here, but we always need actual farmers as right. well. You know? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. That's definitely, definitely true. And and I and so there is a connection then from the farmers um, to consumers or, or customers, because you know, you mentioned that uh, more often now there's a sort of growing movement among consumers to want to know more. And yes, it's not every consumer, right. but I do think. Um, most consumers want something more than maybe they did in the past. To some consumers, that really is that story and that link to the agriculture. So wanting a bit more information, it, you know, if they can get it, what farmers grew, grew this, you know, some of the main ingredients sure. in this food. But if they can't get that, then definitely much more about the supply chain, much more about what's in the product and, and much more about how it's made. That's really a growing area of concern. Absolutely. And at Oatly, we've absolutely seen that. And so um, we have a very proactive way to interact with um, what we call our, our oat fans or our oat punks. Uh, and so we try to put as much of that information as possible, you know, transparency is kind of the key on our website, in our communications, in our reports. And because we want to tell that story about Oatly and about the product, it doesn't mean that we're going to do everything perfectly across the whole supply chain, but it just means that we want to share that story and make that sure. connection with the food. Sure. And we've just seen a growing interest in that. And maybe just only one um, specific example I'll give. Um, something that we've really been advocating for a lot is um, carbon labeling on food. This can be tricky. This can definitely, it's definitely not something that the, the sort of agreed standards and the science is there today, and then everyone's going to apply it perfectly. But the concept of the fact that people are smart, people have figured out nutrition labels, people count calories and carbs and all sorts of sure. things. People can understand carbon too. And they can only understand it though, if it's comparable um, across food products. And so one thing that we've been really advocating for and engaging um, our customers in is really engaging governments about let's put carbon labels on food. Let's get that information into people's hands so that they actually have, they actually know what the impact is of what they're Absolutely. buying. Absolutely. Yeah. And your oat punks are really engaged. They want all of this information. <laughs> like lots of questions. <laughs> Jess, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, so I mentioned that we focus on food waste, which is a very invisible problem. Um, I mean, it's invisible in these climate discussions. You know, we know food, Ashley, you're, you've been making this point a lot that a third of global greenhouse emissions come from the food sector. And if you think about the fact that one third of all food produced for consumption goes to waste, eight to 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions are just to grow, store, distribute, package, sell food that is wasted. Um, and so, of course, you know, long term solutions and step changes to decarbonize different parts of the food sector would address that, but we don't really have time to wait for that. Right. So, prevention of food waste is one of the low hanging fruit, let's say, of ways that we can actually address those climate impacts. And that's really what we're focused on at Appeal. 
in a lot of places, food waste is greatest in consumer households. And that's why even though most products in appeals category, um, don't actually have any consumer labeling appeal has elected to have a consumer facing brand to really engage consumers and make it clear that there are tools and they can, their purchasing decisions can also help them reduce waste in their home. One challenge that we run up against is unlike a lot of other categories in the supermarket, there's not a lot of real estate to communicate in the produce section. You know, maybe you have that tiny sticker, which controversial for other reasons from a sustainability perspective. Um, But we need not just more creative ways to communicate and digital solutions can certainly help with that. Um, But also standardized guidelines around labeling. It's different in every country, some countries, you know, don't want any labeling. Some have other requirements, um, not just so that the information is available to consumers, but also so there's enough education to support so they can sure. understand the carbon labels and there is some amount of standardization. So that's, you know, we're really looking at it more from the produce sector, but food waste is a challenge in every type of food Right. for those that are more perishable and like fresh fruits and vegetables, which are also highly nutritious, these quantities are, you know, 50% that are going to waste, which consumers might not be aware of, but it's certainly something that consumers can influence directly in their own home. It gives them a lot of power, Mm -hmm. but we also need policy and and investment to make sure that that happens. Pat, I want to give you a chance to comment as well, maybe briefly. On, on what your consumers are looking for. So you're not trying to reach vegan consumers. You're trying to reach the other, you know, 99.9% of folks who you're not trying to reach me. <laughs> of course, yeah. I, I mean, I think, first of all, um, I think it's awesome that- Do you want to use your mic? 80%, I, 80% of this group is female. And um, I, I want to take as little time, suck up as little time from them <laughs> as possible. Um, but um, yeah, I think, the way we approach the problem is, first of all, we are not trying to build something new in addition to the incumbent industry. Um, the company was founded, seriously, not because we wanted to be a big food company, but because we wanted to collapse the animal ag industry um, in, the, in, in the best possible way, which is just um, take away their customers by making a better product with a much more sustainable technology, but also make something that better serves their needs as they define them. And frankly, every time we sell a product, I'm vegan, so I love vegans, but uh, my wife's vegan, but um, every time we sell a product to a vegan, I consider it to be a pretty much a waste because um, it didn't didn't steal a customer from the meat industry. And um, I think that's just an interesting thing about food. People don't buy food because um, of the philosophical, sure. you know, um, principles they buy it because they like how it tastes and it's nutritional and it's Absolutely. affordable. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Louise and, and Tanya, I, I want to turn to you. We've, we've touched a little bit on policy here, but we need local governments and we need national governments, but particularly at the local level to recognize that indigenous and traditional practices have significance, that they are solving problems already. And if they were supported in different ways, they could solve problems in a much bigger way. How do we convince local governments who've often been sort of um, influenced by, you know, international agencies or, or others that modernization isn't necessarily the way forward, that we can go forward by looking back in some ways. And maybe Louise, you can go first in case we lose your connection. Definitely. I think um, over here in, my, in the models that we work with, at least, it's showing them that, you know, traditional practices and localizing food systems are actually the more profitable choices. It's the more practical one as well. You don't need to have to be reliant on um, chemicals or importing all these different types of fertilizers or things from, from, from different parts of the world. It's really localizing those systems and using whatever we have um, in our landscapes to actually just develop our soils and make it better. And showing them that profitability is 
one aspect of it, but also sustaining our landscape so that it doesn't give way to degradation and acidification and we don't lose harvests or introduce more harmful things into our own environments and protecting that. I think it shows them that, you know, it's just the more practical solution rather than, um, you know, giving way to these, these large corporations that are taking advantage of our farmers to sell um, things that they really don't actually need. Um, and it's also showing farmers as well and to people that this is accessible, it's equitable, and it's it's actually quite easier if you just went into this than, um, you know, what we've been told for years, that it's actually more difficult. That's such a great point about it being practical and economical, which I think any policymaker could wrap their head around. Tanya, please. So, um, yeah, I agree with the points that Luis have mentioned, has mentioned, um, but I think that something what we're also doing from the Global Hub, and that was one, one of the intentions, we say that a science has a role in informing policy, and one of the missions we have in the Global Hub it's also bring all this evidence. One of the problems that we face with indigenous knowledge and with people like me that has been trained in Western uh, educational systems is like we are thought that in order to make a, a recommendation, you have to show with numbers that this works. But what when there are all the different knowledge systems and when evidence is, is created differently? And to me, one of the explanations for why we should take on board indigenous knowledge is like, despite many threatens that they have faced through the years, they are still here. And the numbers also speak when we talk about biodiversity. But that's not something that we can easily go and tell a policymaker. So what we're trying to do from, from, the, from the Global Hub, it's like to gather experiences. So just let me refer to the UNA food systems that happened recently. We brought together with 60 collaborators around the world with a seven different a, geographical a, a areas around the world and indigenous peoples, many experiences and try to frame it differently. And that was the only publication that we put a paper that was accepted by the scientific committee for the UN Input System Summit. And as that a publication, we are gathering more experiences so we can give recommendations um, we, when we were like working in the summit, we tried to partner like, yes, we need to talk about labeling where the products are coming from. So the, the, the buyers or the consumers are aware of what is happening. Like New Zealand, for example, has good examples of certification of indigenous foods. And we also need to think of, of shorter change, food chains. And I think there are many examples. So I think we need to, yes, uh, gather more evidence. We need to speak to the scientific community, to the policies in the language they need to hear, but I think it's possible slowly. That doesn't also mean that indigenous knowledge should be fighting with modern knowledge. I think Lewis just gave some examples and I agree. We need to bring together different types of knowledge, but we also need to create intercultural policies. So one of the things we do with food policy and when we talk about the climate crisis is like we cannot look at, the, at problems in an isolated way. Um, we need to ensure that territories of peoples, indigenous peoples are guaranteed their rights on their lands, that we have intercultural systems for education because many of the knowledge that they keep has been passed through, an, through orality and we're killing the languages. And actually some people or linguists say, we, we, are, we, we are actually killing the languages. They don't die, we kill them. When we propose a systems that are not considering all the different um, cultures around the world, medicine, food, uh, environment, et cetera. Thank you so much. Oh, of course, please. Yeah, I just wanted to say, first of all, I think you know your experiences are so inspiring and, and what what really stands out to me, and I, I grew up um, in uh, rural Illinois, so what they call the breadbasket of the United States, um, the, the Midwest where lots and lots of uh, different row crops are, are grown at this point, mostly for animal feed, but um, not necessarily always historically. And um, Oatly right now has a project with uh, farmers in that area, not Illinois, but Iowa, the neighboring state in the US. And I, I thought there was a, a story from one of those farmers that was so powerful and it's, it's actually on our website. If you guys want to check out the, the farmer um, story on, on the Oatly website, he said that uh, when Oatly approached him about um, using oats as like a cover crop and doing some um, what we call in the U.S. regenerative practices, he said uh, his when he wanted to participate in the project, um, he's a third generation farmer. His father was super skeptical and, and just didn't know. He thought he was going to lose money. He talked to his grandfather um, 
or, or, or heard through his family of his grandfather's story. And some of the things that, that were being proposed were things that his grandfather had done. And so, and I think it's not just um, uh, that, you know, local historic knowledge is important in developing countries. I think it's part of developed countries farming systems as well. And, and it doesn't mean that we have to go back to um, pulling uh, tractors by horses. Um, I think that it's where some of that knowledge meets how we can apply it in modern ways where that can really lead to the scale up and, and doing things in, in a better way. Absolutely. This combination of sure of, of high and low tech is so important and not low in a, in a demeaning sense, but like there are lower technologies that can have so many benefits. Go ahead, Pat. Oh, I, I, I first of all, I, what you were saying was really inspiring and, and um, I, I don't want to um, just make it about animal agriculture, but any chance to vilify animal agriculture, I will. But I think, you know, historically, and and it's true in the Amazon region and around the world and in the US and so forth, the overwhelming driver of displacement uh, uh, of, indiv of indigenous people and appro appropriation of their land and property was the demand for land for livestock, okay? It was animal agriculture that's, oh, and it's happening right now in the Amazon and, and you know, many parts of the world still, animal agriculture is responsible for 95% of, of the ongoing destruction of the Amazon uh, right now. Um, and here's the thing that, you know, it, just another radical point to make is um, that maybe if we can get rid of animal agriculture, it creates an opportunity. Now the economic need for that land for livestock goes away for um, some of this land to be returned to the indigenous people that originally lived on it, because it's not gonna happen with the current system, but maybe if we can eliminate that driver, um, I think that would be a, a wonderful thing. Thanks so much, Pat. I, I wanna bring up a point that Tanya said earlier about, uh, you know, it, we need to change the evidence or, or we need to have different kinds of evidence available to decision makers, including funders and donors and governments. And so this is kind of a question for you all. And, and Jess, I know you're working to try to get governments to change how they um, uh, do their procurement practices and, and, and to recognize the importance of, of making sure that food is preserved. But, you know, we're here at, at COP26 where it's, it's not just, you know, uh, governments who are here, but there are other kinds of decision makers who we need to be reaching. And so with, you know, and Jess, maybe you go first, how do we reach those decision makers in a way that is compelling so that they understand that these solutions are out there, but they're not the business as usual solutions? I think it's just reframing it to also make it clear that they do make business sense. I think food waste is a again, like a really good example of that. It's a $2.6 trillion problem. Sure. And it's kind of been viewed as this tax on the system. And I think the, the conversation is finally changing so that it's viewed as a, an untapped savings account. Um, you see a lot of movement over the last week from financial institutions in particular. And I think we've seen a big shift over the last year um, if not longer, where companies like Appeal um, are getting a lot of attention and they're not seen as these kind of sustainable, like sure. good ESG and related investments. They're, they just make a lot of business sense. Absolutely. Um, and so I think, especially with this big focus on climate tech, the food, food technology companies need to be at the core of that. I don't know how much they have been up until recently, but hopefully conversations like these are elevating the role of food companies in this kind of push for funding the transition. Absolutely, absolutely. Our, Louise, do you wanna comment on how we can uh, help in, you know, investors and funders and other decision makers sort of change their minds of how, what they invest in and why? I mean, definitely. I agree with a lot of what Jess has already said. I think that um, a, a, another point to communicate is really the urgency in transitioning livelihoods all the way to sustainability and regeneration. I think right now we need to recognize the fact that eventually all businesses, all production methods will have to be sustainable. Um, currently, there is 
uh, case of global soil degradation that in as little as 60 years, we might not even be able to make enough sufficient harvest because of just the state of our soils. And of course, because of the need to make 70% more food by 2050, we need to meet those demands, but we also need to transition whether or not we like it because we won't be able to produce and uh, harvest enough for the global population in the next 30, 50, 60 years. So I think it's just really communicating the urgency that this needs to happen or else you won't even make any business um, down the line. Bravo, we need to keep communicating that urgency. And I know that's why we're all here, but I think this gets lost in these conversations. Every article that I've read in the New York Times this week has not talked about urgency. It's talked about you know the conflict happening here and what we need to keep driving home to everyone here at COP is that we have to act now. We, have, we don't have 11 years, we have tomorrow to make these changes. So thank you so much, Louise, for saying that so eloquently. I, I, I think I, I'd like to turn now to, you know, we've talked a lot about how uh, Tanya and both Louise have brought this up and we've all sort of um, uh, talked about it a little bit. A big transition needs to be, take place. Pat has certainly talked about it, but what concerns me is how do we make it a just transition? for farmers, for consumers who, you know, face a lot of challenges where, you know, in a lot of ways we're talking about wealthy consumers, but, uh, you know, who can choose to, to buy Oatly or can choose to buy Appeal or can choose to buy Impossible Foods. How do we make sure that there, there's a just transition for, for consumers who are not as wealthy as those of us sitting on the stage and for farmers who are struggling and especially livestock farmers, I, you know, uh, they face a ton of challenges. Many of them are caught in a, in a vicious cycle, but others are trying to do the right thing through pasture raised crops. So I, I want to bring up this just transition before we turn to, to Q&A from the audience online and, and, and the, in the audience. Yeah, I'll start uh, if it's okay, because it's something that we, we think about a lot. Um, I think you know, two things. First of all, what um, businesses can do and then what, what governments can do. Right. Um, so on the just transition, and again, in the food sector, I, I really do feel like a lot of that has to do with farmers and, and supporting farmers in this transition. It's also supporting consumers, and, sure. but, but really the uh, focusing on the farmer side for us. I think, um, you know, companies are going to have to get much more uh, knowledgeable and friendly with their supply chains. Like you do actually have to get a few layers in and know where the food that you're buying comes from. And, and, you know, you can't do that for every single ingredient uh, in your product maybe, but which are your big important key ingredients and really engage with those farmers and find out what they need. And, and I think when we do that, like we have a, a, a long going um, partnership with farmers um, in, uh, in Sweden, uh, we find that, you know, they want to diversify. Most of them don't, don't have just animal-based or plant-based sure. products. They're growing everything they can because they, they need a, a diverse uh, income um, in order to, to have resilience. And so just supporting them in that need, understanding what it is um, that, uh, what new income opportunities are available, and then helping to remove some of that risk by right. supporting that either, uh, in, in Oatly's case, we provide some, uh, an agronomist to help them, you know, work through and, and go through what's going to be the impact of various practices. We, um, we support them by giving an additional incentive for growing things in a, in a certain way. Um, but we also don't judge. We don't say like, you've got to get rid of animals. If you're going to, if you're going to work with right, us, we right. realize, we realize that they really need to, to sort of make that decision, um, on their farm. And I think for, um, governments, it really comes down to a few things. I think one, uh, governments need to be investing in research and education around the impacts um, of food and that that knowledge will help drive people um, in, in a better direction. Sure. I think, two, governments need to get rid of the market distortions that are essentially creating this injustice Those by creating these cycles, yeah. like um, subsidies that are driving the wrong kinds of practices. And then finally, I think um, governments need to adjust uh, the programs that they have for farmers. There's a lot of programs out there for farmer support, but it's, they're not focusing on the, on the right things. And they need Absolutely. to be recognizing through insurance breaks or through um, support uh, for uh, research, through support for uh, loans for equipment and things like that. They need to be able to be giving farmers the resources they need in order to make that transition. Absolutely, thank you, Jess. So Appeal's a solution provider. So it really comes down to like, where are we providing that solution? 
Um, so today, a lot of our business has been in high income markets, the US, Europe, et cetera. Um, but so for us, it's really about how do we and other technology providers try to democratize the distribution mm -hmm. of our solution. Mm -hmm. um, so at the end of last year, we entered into a partnership with the IFC that's really focused on how do we distribute our technology more broadly in emerging markets. Um, we're present in some today, but we need to go beyond just applying our product onto produce intended for export, sure. but also in domestic value chains. And that's mm -hmm. where you actually see, in my opinion, the greatest potential of Absolutely. technologies like Appeal. Um, in some places, even if we move fast enough, you know, is there potential for us to not just address food loss and waste, increase income opportunities by creating market access, but maybe even leapfrog the cold chain in some instances and Absolutely. thinking about the climate impacts you know, starts to get a lot bigger, but there have to be partners like IFC who you know, are willing to fund these kind of investments, but also offer the on the ground advisory services to help young companies like Appeal to really understand the places that we're operating in and help with some of the training that goes alongside of that. So exciting. Imagine leapfrogging the whole cold supply chain. That would be amazing. Yeah, just, you know, a small project. <laughs> Pat, do you want to go next? I just wanted to say, uh, so there, you, you raised two aspects about when you're talking about just transition. Uh, consumers making sure that uh, there's consumer access and also that the farmer's livelihoods are protected. And I think um, uh, there's a good outcome from both of them that can also be fast, okay? Um, and what we're trying to do at Impossible Foods just to illustrate this, I'm not don't want to be about impossible foods, but but um, you know the technology that we have to replace animals uses one twenty fifth the land area. Okay, it uses about one ninth the water. It uses less than a tenth the fertilizer and agrochemicals, less farm labor, and we'll get to that. Much less manufacturing labor than making the same products from animals. Okay, all the costs that go into the price of uh, meat or dairy products and so forth um, are lower if you make them directly from plants. So right now our prices on the market are higher than the animal products, but that's for the same reason that, you know, the first iPhone cost probably $10 billion. Um, we're just in the process of scaling up, but, but at scale, what we do, and I would just say plant-based products replacing animals just in general for all the same reasons are vastly less expensive for consumers, healthier, the same nutrition, cheaper. As far as farmers go, um, you know, 40% of Earth's land area right now is being used for animal farming. Okay, huge carbon capture potential. You can calculate the dollar value of that carbon capture potential in a carbon market where carbon is priced at $50 a ton of CO2, which is what most economists think it will eventually rise at. In, in that case, the value of land for that is way higher than the value of land for livestock. You know, f raising livestock is, is very marginal. The US in the UK, 70% of farmers would be, at livestock farmers would be losing money every year if they weren't for subsidy. So it's, but the value of that land for carbon capture is humongous. Sure. And, and um, so those same farmers could say, okay, no one's buying our animal products anymore, but we can make a ton more money by just facilitating the recovery of biomass on mm. that land. I don't think that's a crazy idea. Maybe not crazy, but I do want to turn to Tanya and Louise for the last word and make sure that you have um, a few minutes each to talk about what a just transition looks like for indigenous farmers, Louise, for the farmers you work with in the Philippines. Do you want to go first, Louise? Sorry. For sure, for sure. Um, for, for farmers in the Philippines, I think a just transition would mean, um, first of all, we need to recognize that a food systems transition would look very different in the global north versus the global south, and it would change per region. And for us, that would mean better education on regenerative farming, on funding to support transitions to from existing monocropping to regenerative and agroforestry, um, and giving them support that maintains over the years and is not just some one-time, uh, you know, 
kind of aid that's being distributed. And I think also figuring out climate adaptive, uh, adaptation and food sovereignty for these communities. I was saying this earlier in a plenary, but you can't really teach uh, just transitions and food sovereignty <laughs> and all these things to a farmer who's hungry um, and can't you know, sustain their own family despite the fact that they're producing the world's food. Um, but it's really important to make sure that they are included and they have that self-sufficiency and making sure that policies are in place to protect them and their interests as well as we move forward with that, so. Absolutely, thank you so much. Tanya, final word. Yeah, so I agree with Luis and also what my peers have said. And I think a, just recalling recently in March, there was a newspaper article that said that only the 1% of all the investments that were done in indigenous communities was actually a, arriving to the, hands of, to, the, to the hands of indigenous communities. So I think with a, what we did in the UNA Food System Summit is to create a coalition with the support of six governments. And I think the idea is that we need to invest in indigenous communities, but they need to be the ones leading the research if they want to do certification, all the processes need to be led by indigenous communities supporting education at the same time. Um, and I think that's what we need to do, ensuring they, they can preserve their lands, they write on their territories and they write to self-determination, which I think is a crucial issue now. Bravo, I think uh, in, they need investment and then get out of the way because they know how to manage their lands and their livelihoods the best. Thank you so much. I wanna leave a few minutes, we have about five minutes for, for Q&A. So I don't know if Katie has received some questions online that she'd like to share. Any questions in the audience? This has been such a rich discussion. I've learned so much. These are incredible speakers. So I'm sure you all have some thoughts to share, please. Hi, um, just great. I, I really appreciate all of you and you'll always have a place in the GLF. <laughs> um, but where we get the challenge is not in the north where we get the challenge in GLF is, you know, some guy in Ethiopia family has one cow and it's it, you know, and it's, you know, when you get into that kind of thing or a pig in Uganda, it's the family thing. And, you know, what do we do on, on that kind of level? That's where we get in a challenge with this. And I totally appreciate what you're saying. And uh, like I said, you'll always have a place in GLF. It's very, very important. And I think you're doing great work, but we do have those issues. Well, I think if you have a market-based approach, um, it doesn't compel those farmers to do anything. If, they're, if, 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 they're, if it's their own food security to have a cow or a pig or something like that, or it's something in the local economy, it, it won't be threatened by um, you know, plant-based products that might be healthier and more expensive and, and stuff like that. If they're not accessible, to those farmers, their communities, it's 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 it, it's not going to take away what they're doing, right? No one's going to go and steal their cow or pig. I would never advocate for that. Um, but on the other hand, if there were a system that actually gave them the opportunity to support their families doing uh, something else, and and again, if there were a functional, agreed upon accounting system for carbon capture, that would be the most transformative thing that could happen because it would. It would enable an, a, an actual market um, for carbon capture. And again, most of the land that's being used for animal agriculture in the world right now is a, is a gold mine for carbon capture and any, any reasonable carbon market. That's an opportunity. And in fact, indigenous people who may have lived in a, in a much less disturbed landscape can have their original landscape back. You know, the forest or um, in Illinois, the plains, that used to belong to the native people in uh, North America. Um, so I don't think the point is nobody wants to hurt those people. And I don't think it has to happen. Yeah, and I'll just add on that because I think Patrick's, Patrick is exactly right, but just to make this abundantly clear, <laughs> it is not the um, subsistence farmers who are raising a small number of animals for their own family's use that are the problem, just to be clear. And I think when we talk, even though it seems misleading, like sometimes when we talk about the animal industry or the livestock industry, that is not, that's not it. That's not what we're, we're talking about. So just to be clear there. Well, I just want to make a point on that as well. Grasslands like that used to inhabit all of Illinois and all of the Midwest where I'm from can be incredible carbon sinks and can support livestock if they're managed holistically and, and well in lots of ways. So I think there's a, a lot to be said there too. Um, I don't know if anyone else has another question. 
Sure. Just wait, just real quick for the um, mic. A quick remark. So the government was mentioned a few times uh, in this whole thing, even though it's obviously from a individual and private perspective, mostly. But I think what is looming large is the kind of political philosophical perspective that that you know, governments and uh, people that are politically involved, um, you know, engage in it, it would in, uh, include something like uh, uh, how we view subsidies and what what they what they're there for, for example, uh, in Geneva, on the border on in Geneva you would have subsidy because Switzerland is one of the most subsidizing countries on the on the earth, and so you you would have uh, agriculture in Geneva where right on the other side in France you have none because it's not really um, effective in that way. So I guess. I would like to know what you what your views or your thoughts are on that, uh, the political philosophical perspective uh, that would um, uh, that would coincide and, and that would um, go well with your approaches. Just I'll just make a quick comment on that because I'm sure others have something to say. But but this came up in an earlier event as well, and I think um, you know, ten years or so ago. Um, it was there was a, a political or phil philosophical block to talking about getting rid of subsidies in the fossil fuel industry. And look how that conversation has changed. And so we need policymakers to get beyond that block and really think what what you're saying, which is take take that view of what should we really be using subsidies for and using these economic incentives for and shouldn't we be using them to um, incentivize the kind of practices we want. And if countries can come together and say, okay, we're going to stop subsidies for the fossil fuel industry, can't that also happen uh, in agriculture? Absolutely. Take exactly. sort of pragmatic uh, perspective. I think the problem is, to be honest, it's a big problem at COP, is that the policymaking um, is dominated by the wealthy and powerful, and the victims are not. That's really what it comes down to. And look, even the the fossil fuel industry is still getting su subsidized. It's totally wacko, but there there are, there are people with a lot of money and power that want to keep those in place. And that's why basically I think COP is not going to be able to make much good and as long as it's dominated by those interests. Well, I'm hoping somebody can end on a more hopeful note. We have time for one more comment. So I'm gonna, Louise, I, I wanna make sure that you have a chance to talk or Tanya. Louise, end us on something hopeful about changing the minds of governments and the philosophy that, you know, the, uh, that surrounds some of these debates. I mean, from my perspective, working with local governments, it's, I think it's, it depends on the governance structures as well, depending on your region. And in, in mine, I've worked closely with the local government and really reshaping this model because that accomplishment and, you know, showing these models and showing that it's possible um, sure. is something that other people can emulate in different parts of the world and different parts of my country, at least. Um, so for, for the Cal project, with the work we've done with the local governments, there's been other local governments in different parts of the region who wanted to replicate that. And it's very much possible. Um, I think it's just, you know, getting through that barrier of people saying you can't do this or it's not possible or, uh, you know, it's going to be too difficult and showing them it is. Uh, and that might fall onto private individuals or corporations and private, um, you know, like uh, private businesses to actually do that. And there is not easy and it's a very slow transition, but it will be worth it in the long term. Thank you. That's a great point to end on. I really appreciate that. I want to give all of our panelists a round of applause, please. Thank you all for being here. Do you want to say any final words? Great. Thank you all for coming. And, and I hope to see those of you who are online someday in person. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.